All right. Chag Purim Katan Sameach. A little Purim. Uh, so I just want to give a warning for everyone who has perhaps audio sensitivities. I might be burpy because uh, to celebrate Purim, I am drinking a beer. So why not? Um, and I will try to restrain myself as much as possible. Um, so we are, uh, the subject of tonight's class is what is um, one of my favorite topics to talk about because it is a mystery in history. Uh, the question of what exactly Purim Katan is is I think a really interesting one, a sneakily interesting one, and one actually that teaches us something very interesting about the nature of halakha, of Jewish life and law, or law in life. Um, but first, before we get into the you know the woolly questions that I, that I love to get into, what is Purim Katan? <laughs> uh, what is Purim Katan? Just give me the, do you have any idea whatsoever? Let's just see. What are the, what are the basics? There's the basic deets. Burp. Okay, Purim Katan. Purim Katan happens only during a leap year. Why? Because Purim Katan is the day that would be Purim, um, but it's not Adar. Well, it is Adar, but it's not the right Adar, right? So the way that a Jewish calendar is leap yeared or intercalated, as the fancy English word is. The way the calendar is intercalated is that they, instead of squeezing just an extra day in the month of February, they instead do a whole nother February, right? They do a whole nother month of Adar. And the reason for this is because uh, the Jewish calendar is unique in being both a lunar calendar and a solar calendar. It's a lunar calendar in the sense that the months uh, are, peg are pinned to the phases of the moon. But it's a solar calendar because the Jewish holiday cycle only makes sense if it syncs with the agricultural year. So while the Chinese year and the Islamic calendars are purely lunar, which means that their months like Ramadan in the Muslim calendar can be at different times in the solar year, depending on the nature of the lunar uh, calendar. The Muslim calendars, ho Muslim holidays are not, don't have an agricultural sensibility to them. But Sukkot only makes sense in the fall. Passover only makes sense in the spring. It's literally called Chag Ha'aviv, the spring holiday. It would be weird if Passover were in November. So the holiday, the, the calendar needs to be regulated once in a while to make sure that, in, that the months sync up with where they're supposed to be. Um, so the way that the rabbis do that is once in a while, they intercalate the year, which is also called uh, with the Hebrew word ibur, which is actually a synonym for pregnancy. They conceive a new month in the year, and that's Adar. So while normally Adar would be the month of Purim, in a leap year, there's Adar Aleph and Adar Bet. There's Adar Rishon and Adar Sheni, Adar One, Adar Two. And if you were to guess, in which Adar does real Purim happen? Or as we're going to call it in this class, Big Purim. When is Big Purim? Yes, Adar Sheni, exactly. Which is why during Adar Rishon, which is the month we're in right now, we have Purim Katan. But okay, so let's back up, zoom out a minute. What do we do on Purim to signify that it's Purim? Like, what are the major Purim practices? What do you have to do on Purim? Rosie, what do you have to do on Purim? See, read, it. read the Megillah, right? What else? Give Front what? Center hooks. What do we give out? Mishloach. Yeah. Good. Okay, so we read the Megillah. We give out gift baskets, which are called Mishloach Manot. Ellen. Also, also um, make donations to the needy and poor. Great. Gifts to the poor. Matanot Le'avionim. What else do we do on Purim? There's a special prayer that we say. Like, like on Hanukkah, because Purim is also a holiday that celebrates a miracle. We say the prayer Al Hanisim during the Amida. And last but not least, the other thing we do is we have a big feast. 
It's not just a nice thing to do, it's actually a requirement. It's one of the mitzvahs of Purim. One of the mitzvahs of Purim is that you make a suda, a sidas Purim, sidas pirim. Um, what do you have to do on Purim Katan? Like, what do we do on Purim Katan? There's one main thing that we do, I guess I would say. The main thing that we do on Purim Katan is you don't say tachnun. That's the main thing. You don't say the special, like, I, I'm sorry prayers. That's what I think the main practice of Purim Katan. But what is Purim Katan? Like, what is this day? It's basically, I think for most people, a day that you don't say tachanun. That's kind of it. Right? There's nothing, anything you have, you don't have to, okay, well, we'll get into it. So, my point is, what does it mean to have a holiday in which you don't have to do anything? What is that holiday? Like, even, like, even Rosh Chodesh, right? Like, you don't, it's not, you don't have to, like, do anything too special on Rosh Chodesh or whatever, but, like, one thing, you have to say Halil, right? At least you do something. Purim Katan, what do you do? Like, to be shvat, you have a seder. Fine, okay. You have a atzma'ud, you have a barbecue. Cool, fine. What are other, like, minor holidays? Uh, Tisha B'Av, I mean, that's a major day. Whatever, you fast. What's another, what are, like, kind of non, non-big deal Jewish holidays? Every Jewish holiday is a big deal, you know what I'm saying. Ones that Bomer? you to work. Huh? Lag Bomer? Lag Bomer, what do you do? You have a fire? No, no, yeah. You have the you have the Hilula for for Rashbi. Okay, we all know what we do. We do haircuts. There's things that are associated with it. What's other, what other what are other weird stuff? What are other weird days in Jewish calendar? Um, yeah, okay, that's enough. So point is, Purim Katan is perhaps unique in the sense that like there's nothing associated with it. Not even like a minhag. Like what do you do? So what 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 is so provocative to me about this is what does it mean to have? Uh, in a religion that's so focused on chiyuv, so focused on obligation, what does it mean to have a day that is not structured by your requirements? And what does that actually mean about what type of system halacha is? Is halacha really, in a way, just about what you are forced or obligated to do, or is there something else going on that finds its unique expression in Purim Katan? So let's jump into it together. It was very fun. So this is such a fun topic for me. Um, so much that actually, I actually crafted the source sheet 10 years ago. Uh, and it was very funny, like remembering when I was in the law school library at NYU, putting it together. So uh, here you got a vintage Josh Schwartz uh, source sheet from 2011. Um, and I didn't reformat it because the only version of it I have is PDF. Um, because my computer has crashed in between making that source sheet and today. So the only version of it I have in any source is the one that I cannot change. Um, and so yeah, you get to see a little bit of, a little fun, a little fun Josh Schwartz artifact. Okay, great. It's a rare, rare Josh Schwartz Pokemon card. I'm selling this as an NFT if anyone's interested. Just kidding. It's a terrible scam. Okay, so this is a, a class called Freedom Within the Law, or the Mystical Secrets of Purim Katan. And I did spell Purim Katan with a two, two T's to honor our greatest uh, entertainer, Chris Katan. All right. Um, so let's start with uh, the Megillah, because, you know, it's kind of the source text for what's going on here. Uh, so we start. It says, Megillah's Esther, chapter 9, verse 19. And, and very interestingly, and we'll talk about this when Big Purim happens, um, Megillah's Esther is, is somewhat unique. It's similar to Devarim, the book of Deuteronomy, in the sense that it is a meta-textual text. It is a text that has a consciousness of itself, right? Devarim presents itself as a text, right? This is Moses's, a record of Moses's last addresses to the people. And it has a sense of it being like a, a you know, like a coherent whole. Megillus Esther does too, because it is something that has a conception of like, oh, this is the source text for a holiday, Purim, right? This is like the programming code for Purim. So here's a famous line. Al Kane Hayehudim a Peruzim, Hayoshvim Barea Prazot, Asim Ed Yom Arbaasar Lachodashadar. So the Jews in the scattered out places, like in the exurbs, living in the villages, who live in these scattered out places, they made the 14th of Adar Purim. Simcha u right? They made it a holiday, Simcha, a joyous celebratory day, a mishte, a day of feasting, and a yantif, eh, a yantif, a good day. U manot ish l're'ehu, 
What else do you do on Purim? It even says it in the very Megillah, right? It says, and you give friend, you give gifts to your friends. Okay, those are the core I, aspects of what Purim entails. Simcha, Mishta, Yantif, right? It's a good, it's a happy day. It's a celebratory day. You make a feast. You give out gifts. Now, these are the things we understand. Purim is a day of generosity and of celebration. That joy finds its most natural and its most robust expression in giving. All right, not in taking, but in giving. Um, we'll get to that when we talk about Big Purim in about a month. But here comes the Ramba, Maimonides, 12th century, uh, Spanish-Egyptian doctor, rabbi, legalist. He did everything. He was the best. Mitzvahs Purim. He says, the mitzvah of Purim, liyotan yom simcho mishto mishloch mano l'reim. So he basically quotes that pasuk, right? It's a day of, of celebration. It's a day of feasting, giving up gifts to your friends. And he has tax on this notion of a matanot le'avinim, and gifts to the poor. Okay. Umutar ba'asyat melacha. And you are allowed to do work on Purim. Va'afal pichain ein ra'ui la'asot bo melacha. You're allowed to do malacha on Purim, but even so, it's not uh, fitting to do it. Okay, so on what days are we not allowed to do malacha? Let's just make this very explicit. Not a trick question. What days are we not allowed to do labor? High holidays. Yeah, high holidays. Beginning and end of Passover. Yeah, Yuntiv. And then the big one. Shabbat. Shabbos, exactly. Good, right. It, those days are defined by the fact that you're not allowed. They are, it's actually, you know, I'm learning Hilchas Shabbos right now, laws of Shabbos. And one thing that's really struck me is that every Shabbos, we unbuild the Mishkan, right? The 39 labors that you're not allowed to do on Shabbat are the 39 tasks that it took to build God's sanctuary. So every day, every week, we, in a sense, create an open space that is Mishkan-shaped by our refraining from acting. It's like a dialectically uncreative act. It's, it's, a, it's a really beautiful way of thinking about kind of like a negative space version of Abram Joshua Heschel, Blessed Memory's notion of, a, of Shabbos as a castle in time. You're actually carving out space by not filling it with yourself, by not filling it with your interventionary activities. But Purim, interestingly, right? We've, we're just talking about regular Purim, Stam Purim, Big Purim, whatever. A Purim, it says, Ra Ramam says, you're allowed to do work, but you shouldn't. That's an odd statement in a law code. Law, you think, is binary, black, white, mutter, usser, right? Permitted, forbidden, kosher, treif, pure, impure, right? It's based in categories. What category is this? You're allowed to do it, but I mean, you know, maybe don't, right? This is like a Purim is a rare occasion Right, this is regular Purim, but even regular Purim, it's a rare occasion in Jewish law, or just in, I would say in, in law as a discourse, in which it is not just a quantitative, like binomial statement, do this, don't do this, but within the that those like black lines, those bright lines, it then has like a dimmer switch. It has a qualitative statement, a question about not just what is allowed, not allowed, but in a way, a values question. What's the what's the right way to do something? What's what's better. Right? So we have a room for not just for what is allowed or forbidden, but also what is ideal, what is aspirational even maybe. What's the, what does the best practice of this look like? That you're not going to be punished for missing it, but really it's showing you a way forward. So it's a very curious thing to see in a law code, right? Mishnah Torah, Rambam's this is one of the, this is really the first, re, like the first robust Jewish law code, right, that was published. Um, not the first Jewish legal text, obviously, but the book, first kind of, that kind of reformatted all Jewish literature and presented it in code form. But even within this code, it's now getting blurry. It's getting funky and fuzzy. You're allowed to do work on Purim, 
but you know, don't. Maybe. I, I you shouldn't. So that's the kind of that gray area I want to keep on pushing into. So Amru Chachamim, the sages said, "Kol haosem alacha biyom Purim enu roes siman bracha laolam." Anyone who does work on Purim, like, and by that what they mean is like. They don't mean like turning on lights and stuff. They hear what they mean is like go to your job or something like that. Now, listen, none of this is like b blaming anybody for having to go to their job. We live in Gullis, right? We live in exile, and bosses make us go to jobs. You know, this is what it means not to be free yet. Mashiach isn't here. When Mashiach's here, no more bosses. So, not this isn't blaming anybody for going to work, but it's saying it's making a statement about an ideal. Anyone who goes to their job, effectively, on Purim, it will see no sign of blessing in their life ever. Sorry. Uh, you know, what are you going to do? So, what kind of statement is that? Right? How do, you, well, how do you take the rabbi's sentiment that they just expressed? Any thoughts, provocations, reactions? I think it's more of a statement of what are your values? You know, like, what, what do you put first in your life? Uh -huh. And... Um, you know, if living a Jewish life is is what in, what's important to you, then you would put Purim first before work. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so it's giving yeah. But well, here's it's about values. It's about in terms of what kind of priorities order your decisions, and it's also in a way putting some of what it means to live Torah, not just externally as an externally imposed decision, right? Something what's called in fancy academies heteronomy right a, a law imposed from the outside but it's autonomous it's law from the inside because you decide if you are going to be in the, you know accord with that value or not no one's forcing you to do it like halach you're not sinning by going to work on porn it's just that like Renee said, you're not valuing it in the same kind of way as somebody who would use one of their unpaid days off to 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 get drunk with their friends or whatever, right? To to celebrate Purim, right? So there's some law or some aspect of what it means to be observing Torah. That's not just this external light switch question of allowed, not allowed, but within that light, you know, it's more of a light dimmer switch some kind of room between what's the what's the ideal way to do this and what's the acceptable way to do this right again you're totally permitted to go to your job on purim it's just you know a bummer it's a bummer um okay any other uh, reactions to this kind of interesting middle ground that's an unexpected you know phenomenon in a law code again this is a law code this is like looking opening up a book of tax law and being like you know what here's what you have to declare if you're running a small business here's what you don't have to declare but really you should that's not how tax works right if you don't have to declare something you won't do it people i mean listen people don't declare tons of things they're supposed to declare but if you don't have to declare something you don't but this is saying, hey, here's a bunch of stuff you don't have to declare, but really do. You should. It's the good, it's the right thing to do. It's the, it's the best thing to do. Yeah. Um, mm. Sorry, I don't know. The way I guess I kind of tend to look at statements like this is that, you know, I, right, like I don't think of it as like, if you uh, work on Purim, then the consequence will be that, like, you don't receive any blessings. But especially with, like, the language of um, Ruah Siman, Bracha, like, mm -hmm. it, it seems to me like, you know, the Hachamim are saying that, like, if you would choose to work on a day like Purim, like, there must be something, like, kind of essential about, like, the the nature of the day that you're just missing that you're just like not mm. able to see um you know that there is something special about the day and if you mm -hmm. like were aware of that then you would make the choice to not work mm -hmm. yeah so th that's a great point it's an evaluative point that's being made by the rabbi slash rambam right that that like if you get purim 
then how would you ever want to go to your job? Right? Like this is a day of joy, of celebration. You know, you know what they say, you know, like if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. That was a statement written by somebody who's never had a job. Right? Anyone who's had a job understands, you know, like um, there's actually a great book that I'm about to start reading by a, a, a journalist uh, named Sarah Jaffe called Work Won't Love You Back. And it's a critique of this whole like, a, you know, rehabilitation of jobs of like, oh, yeah, you just have to find what you love to do. Like, listen, some of us are lucky. We do have jobs that what we love to do. I, I have a job that I love to do. But all jobs mean you have competing obligations. You need to go to work. Right? You need to do things that when you don't want to do it. But Purim is a day in which any kind of constriction on your ability to celebrate, on your freedom, as it were, means that, yeah, you're missing something essential about the day. How could you do Purim in the break room of your office? Unless, of course, you were to egg your boss. Maybe then I would understand some kind of interesting subversive Purim or something like that, sure. But point being. And again, this isn't like this. Again, this is not judging anyone who goes to the job. You know, we all make Purim as much as we can. But rather, Purim has room inside of it of this kind of yeah aspirational ideal because the day fits it. Or the day it's appropriate for that day. But again, this is all within the scope of regular Purim. Big Purim. Stam Purim. Um, let's keep on going with this Gemara. So here's a from Masachis Megillah, which is the main Talmudic tractate, well, the only Talmudic tractate, on Purim. It says, Vehitni Rav Yosef, Simcha, Mishta, Vyantiv, Simcha. Okay, so he's quoting the Pasuk that we saw above. Right now he's seeing how I put together these source sheets. You work backwards, right? You find a text and you find, and you start with the kernels, with the sources of it. Simcha. What does Simcha mean? Simcha teaches us, Milamed Asurim Behespeid. What does Simcha mean? It means you're not allowed to um, give a eulogy. Mishta. What does Mishta mean? A feast. Milamed Asur Bata'anit. That you're not allowed to fast. Yantif. Malamed she'asur v'asiyas melacha, v'asiyat melacha. And the phrase Yom Tov, right, which means holiday, calling Purim a holiday, like any other Yom Tov, Pesach, Sukkot, Shavuot, etc., Rosh Hashanah, that you're not allowed to do work. Well, that's different from what Rambam just said. Now that stira, or seeming stira, that contradiction is going to, we're going to spend some time thinking about that. But another aspect I want to point out is that the, the, the Rav Yosef's definition of Purim is entirely dialectical. Simcha doesn't mean you have to be happy. It means you're not allowed to induce sadness, right, by making a eulogy. Mishta doesn't mean you have to gorge on poppers. Although, have no fear, I have eaten poppers today. But rather that you're not allowed to fast. And yuntif means you're not allowed to work. So there is something rubbing up against each other, contradictory, constraining about these elements. So what is it, I mean, so on one hand, in a way, it's a more, let's say, liberal definition in the sense that you can have happiness Happiness isn't positively defined, according to Rav Yosef. It's dialectically defined. It's just that you don't have to be sad. That even you're not allowed to do extra sad stuff. Feasting, feast day, a feast day. It doesn't mean you need to make a feast. But rather, it means you're not allowed to not eat. But very interestingly, he sees work as being completely contravening the essence and the nature of Purim. It's a yontif. You can't do malacha on Purim. To do malacha on Purim would mean it's not a yontif, so you can't do it. So Rav Yosef's definition of Purim is on one hand smaller because it's what you it's mostly focused on what you're not allowed to inflict on yourself. But on the other hand, it's bigger in the sense that he basically groups it with the other big, you know, the other big holidays in which you, you are you have to totally kind of change over your life. You're not allowed to live normal life. You can't go to you can't go to work, you can't, I mean, he would even maybe say you can't turn on a light, you can't light a fire, da da da. His, you know, his, his version doesn't win out, obviously. But um, it's interesting, though, but the thread I'm trying to explore is that Purim seems to be a more 
labile space in halacha, a more fungible space in halacha, a space in halacha that is less about what you have to do and more about carving out space for what is best to do. Does that difference make sense? It's somewhat of a subtle point, but Purim, because in a way it's a minor holiday, is less about these kind of bright line obligations that are imposed on your life. You have to do this, you have to do that. And more actually about opening up a space about what, what would you do if you had the keys to the car, right? If you had the keys to the Purim car, what would that road trip look like? Vroom, vroom. Um, does that, does that, does, does that, I'm trying to make sure that that connection makes sense. You know, with Rav Yosef's no, no, no definition, he's reshifting Purim, not about being, you know, Rambam specifies specific things you need to do. Do this, do that, et cetera, et cetera. But Rav Yosef is actually about, no, Purim is not about what you need to do but rather about taking away things that would keep you from doing it. Let's try, I think, of an analogy. It's the difference between, let's say, Valentine's Day, La Havdil Elif Havdalis. On Valentine's Day, you're chayiv to give your partner flowers, and you're chayiv to give your partner a heart-shaped box of chocolate, and you're chayiv to eat at least a kezayis of, ch of, of chocolate on the day. That's your, those are your, that's the halakha of, of Valentine's Day. That's one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking of Valentine's Day is on Valentine's Day, you are not allowed to um, watch a sad documentary. And you're not allowed to um i don't know yeah you're not allowed to fast or whatever right the point is is it's carving out more autonomous space in terms of what it can look like you can tailor it more to what it makes sense to you so rav yosef's kind of dialectical definition of Purim doesn't say what you need to do to make it sure it's a day of joy and feasting and a good day, but rather takes away the things that would keep those things from occurring so that you can actually, in a way, tailor define Purim to suit your own predilections. Again, Rav Yosef doesn't win, right? Like the, the, the more dictatorial model of Purim wins, that you need to have a feast, you need to give gifts to the poor, you need to give Mishchalach Manos, you need to read the Megillah, da da da. Um, yeah, 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 Adar in general, I have a different shear about that, but like the, you know, Mishnechmas Adar Marbin Basimcha, unlike Av, right, when we, Av is defined by what you are, you have to do. Right? You can't eat meat, you don't drink wine, you don't do this, you don't do that, you don't get haircuts, you don't clip your nails, blah, blah, blah. It says, ah, when Adar comes, you get happy. How? Blah. Right? Like, I don't know, I'm not going to tell you. And, and the thrust of that shear, which I, which I have taught before, is that, yeah, because happy, happiness is personal. And it wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't work for me to say, oh, this is what it means to be happy. Eat this much meat, drink this much wine, blah, blah, blah. It's actually about discovering what makes you happy, and that's actually a whole self journey of self-discovery. That's quite a, quite a beautiful point that's made. So that's a different cheer. We'll have to do that some other time. But point with this, right, with Rav Yosef's Purim, it does map to that. That's a good point, Maxine. That it is less about what specific things you need to do, and more about making sure you have the conditions to, so that you're not prevented from accessing Purim. The reason I'm tugging out this thread is because even though Big Purim ends up becoming a day that is defined by specific things we need to do, you might see where I'm going, Little Purim ends up being more free. It preserves this more anarchic, less defined, personalizable Purim. All right, let's get back. So this is from the Mishnah on Megillah. It says, 
Kiru ata Megillah Adar Harishon, Vinit Abra Hashana, Korino Taba Adar Shini. Um, Ain Bain Adar Harishon, Adar Shini, Ella Kriat Megillah Matanot Lavionim. So, normally you read the Megillah on Purim, fine. But, if it is a leap year, Nit Abra Hashana, if the year is pregnant, on Adar Harishon, you don't do it. But you do read it on Adar Shini. And it says here there's no difference between first Adar and second Adar except for Kriyat Megillah and Matanot Levyonim. The difference between Big Purim and Little Purim, effectively, is that on Big Purim you read the Megillah, and on Big Purim you give gifts to the poor. On Little Purim you don't. But then what maybe what 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 can you draw from that from that comparative statement? All right, there are five things we need to do on Purim, right? Five things. al feasting, gifts to the poor, gifts to your friends, and Megillah. So no Megillah, no gifts to the poor, but maybe then on Adar for Purim Katan, you still have to give Shalach Manot. Maybe you still have to throw a feast. Maybe you still have to say al -Hanisim. Right? Though That's possible. I'm not saying it's, 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 it's true. But point I'm trying to make here is that Purim Katan ends up kind of being in this weird, maybe vague zone. Back to the Rambam. Rambam says, Shnei hayamim ha'elu shehein 14 and 15. So we bring back Rav Yosef, right? These two days, 14th and 15th of Adar, you're not allowed to make a eulogy, right? Which is what is defined by these happy occasions. And you're not allowed to make a fast. This is drawing on a, a an early Tanaitic text called uh, Megillat Tanit, which was recently put out in addition by an Israeli professor named Vered Noam, um, which lists a whole bunch of days in which you're not allowed to be sad basically. So he's grouping Purim amongst these days in which you're not allowed to bum yourself out. So Purim, Purim and Shushan Purim, 14th of Adar and 15th of Adar. You're not allowed to make a eulogy and you're not allowed to fast. So those are the two main things of what it means to bum yourself out in Jewish law. Um, says, ah, that applies both to big Purim and little Purim in Adar Rishon and Adar Sheni. The 14th and 15th are days that you're not allowed to bum yourself out. So back to my original claim that the main thing you do not you do on Purim Katan is you don't say Tachanun, right? You don't say the Yom Kippur style prayer of what we, you know, the litany of things that we're sorry about. It doesn't fit for Purim. That fits the more Rav Yosef model of the things that we make sure not to do, not to bum ourselves out. All right. So here comes the rubber, here's where the rubber hits the road. Just to summarize, Purim, big Purim, regular Purim, has specific things that are programmed into it that are supposed to induce celebration and joy in us. Reading the Megillah, the story of our miraculous triumph over our enemies. Giving gifts to the poor because generosity is the truest expression of joy. Giving gifts to your friends because what is a more beautiful expression of love and happiness than being kind and giving with people that you care for? But throwing a feast and or, or eating a feast, right? Pigging out and engorging to your heart's content, right? And, 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 and singing about the miracles that God has done for us, right? These are all things that, that, that turn up the volume and, uh, and stoke the fires of joy. But the Rav Yosef model of Purim isn't about specifically doing things. It's about making sure that you don't do anything that would prevent you from being happy. And that seems to be more of the model that Purim Katan is in. Purim Katan, you don't read the Megillah. You don't give gifts. So then what do you do? Well, it says in the, it says in, uh, in, the, in the law we just said, you don't eulogize and you don't fast. Okay, you're not allowed to make yourself sad. But then what do you do? So here comes the tour. The tour is maybe my favorite halachic book. The tour is my favorite halachic book, I think, because it is the it is the wooliest. The Shulchan Aruch is like bullet pointy, and it's very to the point. It's I mean, listen, it's wonderful. Shulchan Aruch is great, but the tour takes you on a journey, 
and it gives you, it takes you on a tour, a tour, ha ha ha, takes you on a tour of all of these medieval rabbis. It gives you all of these different opinions, and it is not always the most practically oriented text. Not always. Hopefully sometimes, but not always. Um, so here, here, here's what he says. Yom Yudalad Vitesvav, Sheva Adar, Harishon. So 14th and 15th of Adar Rishon, okay, so it's today and tomorrow. Purim Katan and Shushan Purim Katan. Lil Purim and Lil Shushan Purim. Mutarim Behespade, Vita'anit. What? So he's now saying you're allowed to eulogize. You're allowed to fast even on Purim Katan, says the tour. So then what in the world is Purim Katan? I'll be very clear. It's like really underscore this. It is kind of like, it's a weird point I'm making, but I think it's a real one. Purim Katan at the very bottom seemed to have been fine. Maybe you don't have to do anything. You don't have to read the Megillah. You don't have to do it, whatever, this, that, you know, you don't have to give gift baskets. But at least you're not going to bum yourself out by, like, going to a funeral or, like, fasting. You know, you're not going to, like, depreciate your body or, like, sadden yourself. But then the tour comes around and says, nah, you're, uh, you're allowed. You're allowed to basically make this any other day. What's the meaning of Purim Katan? Nothing. Yeah, uh, Renee, are you raising your hand or are you, are you uh, thumb, thumbs up just for fun? Oh, thumbs down. Uh-oh. I, I don't know. I maybe sorry. Oh, no, no, no worries. <laughs> I didn't um, okay, so wait, so that's the, the way, that's the, that's the anonymous position that the Torah is quoting. Okay, Safer meets vote, but the Safer Mitzvahs, um, it says, Katav she'asurin behespeid v'ta'anit v'chol ashanim. So he's quoting Rambam, right? But Rambam's book of mitzvot. And he says, you're not allowed to eulogize. You're not allowed to fast on uh, 14th or 15th of Adar in any of the Adars, first or second. Af al pi shalo kiru ha even though you don't read the Megillah. V'chein katav arif, and that's what Yitzchak al-Fasi also says, who's a, a, a um, he's, uh, where's, where's, uh, he's from Al-Fez, which is in Morocco. Right? Um, or Tunisia. So, Sarikh Lahar Bot Boba Suda. Okay. <laughs> okay, we have a range of opinions now. The tour says you're allowed to bum yourself out on Purim Katan. Rambam says you're not, you don't have to read the Megillah, but still, you can't bum yourself out. And then the riff comes along and says not only are you not allowed to bum yourself out, but you actually have to make a you have to like pig out you have to like have your favorite food you have to treat yourself to poppers i love poppers this is the main takeaway from this year i love poppers um the food poppers um what <laughs> how is this a law how is this a law code the law says the legal text says purim is either a normal day in which you can really make yourself sad, or it is a day of feasting which you are obligated to have like a big dinner. Those are contradictory sentiments. Not just sentiments, programs. What? What does that mean, Susie? Cheddar or cream cheese? Poppers. <laughs> Cheddar poppers? Mm. They're way better than the cream cheese ones. Anyway, sorry, this is being recorded. I know, I, was, I meant chicken. Oh, oh yeah, I know. I saw actually, I, bought, I, I ordered them from a, from a, from a, a kosher a junk food store, uh, which is fabulous. Well, they call them American poppers. So maybe that's when I say poppers, I mean like. Yeah. Poppers, you mean jalapeno poppers. I don't know what chicken poppers Oh, are. no, okay. Well, <laughs> then I would say jalapeno poppers. That, you have to be mediac about that. If you don't say jalapeno, then you don't mean jalapeno poppers. I, I am so uh, glad. Poppers or chicken? I've never heard of chicken poppers. Wow. Yeah, listen, maybe this is my like marrow centrism coming through. 
Wow. Okay. All right. Listen, the, the the chat is blowing up that nobody's heard of chicken poppers before. All right. Maybe it's just boneless wings. I guess that's also what people call them. They're little chicken nugget things, but they're not like nuggets because they're not in like nugget form, but they're like, you know, little like... You mean popcorn chicken? Yeah. Uh -huh. popcorn. More like that. Okay. All right. Fine. Point is, they're delicious. Uh, <laughs> and they're drenched in sauce. Um, that's the difference. So like like... It's not like a nugget because the nugget's dry and you dip into something. It's it's more like it has a breading, but it's still it's it's in sauce. It's already sauced. Um, Wait, so are we feasting or are we not? What's happening? Well, you know exactly right. Okay, and Matt, yeah, I'm trying to find like think, can we think, think of the analogy? New Year's Eve is either a day in which you are you go home and you you know you scroll through your 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 computer, you know your your phone until you feel sad and lonely, and then you go to sleep. Or it is a day where you go out and have a party with your friends and have the time of your life. Those are the two, and, and that's the people's takes on New Year's Eve. Those are contradictory. Right? Purim Katan is either a day in which you can literally do the saddest thing in the entire world, which is to eulogize someone you love. Or it's a day in which you throw a huge party with all your friends. What? So there's something that is like provocatively undefined about Purim Katan which is what I find so fascinating about it. I don't mean it when I say this, but Shabbos is easy. Shabbos is obvious. Shabbos is a day that has so much poured and programmed into it that to treat it like any other day mean you are just completely blind, right? You are completely missing the point of what Shabbos is all about. All right, for you to like, uh, desacralize Shabbos, right? Means you miss all of the things that are like the way that the law is protecting you from vi from violating it. But Purim has like no protections around it, and Purim Katan all the fewer, right? I'm gonna go back to the thing like, oh yeah, you're allowed to work on Purim, says Ramba, but maybe you shouldn't. So here comes Purim Katan. It's like, yeah, you you know, you're allowed. One version of it is that you like you can even do things that are sad, but another version of it is that you have to do things that are happy. So where where are we left? Um, okay, so anyone learning the tour, of course, you can never learn the tour without the debate being safe, which is the commentary of Yosef Karo, who's also the author of the Shulchan Aruch. But any real Karo head um, is going to say that the greatest, you know, his greatest composition was not the Shulchan Aruch. That's just the, like, that's just the, the cliff, the, what do they call in Canada? Not Cliff's Notes, um, Cole's Notes, right. Cole's Notes. I, I, I read your lips right now. Uh, Cole's Notes of, uh, of the, of, of the Beit Yosef. But the Beit Yosef is just like the tour, a wild and, and crazy ride through Torah. So, says Yosef Karo, the Chain Halacha, this is the law. Okay, the law is, you don't need to be so machmir about making a feast and 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 rocking out uh, for uh, Purim Katan. But the, the Ashkenazi gloss on the Mishnah Torah, Katavu B'Shem, Sefer Mitzvot HaKatan, the smak, an, uh, an earlier uh, Rishon rabbi. Point is that a, a commentary on the Mishnah Torah quotes an earlier rabbi saying, So they, they're quoting the smak, the Hagah Maimonio, saying that the whole world never really had the practice of making a feast and and rejoicing and celebrating, except on the fourteenth day of Adar Rishon. Um, but nowadays we don't even do that. Okay, what's the uh, uh, so Yosef Karo starts by saying. Listen, the riff, God bless him, I don't agree with him. Nobody really has the chumrah, nobody has the real stringency of making a feast or, or, or you know, throwing a big party for Purim Katan. But 
this commentary on the Rambam says that, you know what, actually people do, but only on the 14th, not the 15th of first Adar. But obviously on the second, you know, second month of Adar, of course, everyone, everyone rocks out. And then he says, yeah, but nowadays, really, nobody really does that. What? <laughs> Everything that people say about Purim Katan is contradicted by the next thing that people say, right? In a way, the single position, I mean, the, all the positions matter, don't get me wrong, but what I'm trying to really say is, like, I'm trying to zoom out and show that, like, Purim Katan is so a non-entity when it comes to law. Right? What it becomes is a day in which people are arguing about things that maybe you should do. Not things you have to do. Because look how Yosef Karo changed the terms of the, deba of, of the, of the debate. Not about chayav. Right? The riff said, sarich laharbot bosuda. You need to make a big party. But he said machmir. And what does, what's the difference between machmir and chayav? That's a question. What's the difference between Machmir and Chayav? Yeah, so you're, you're bringing in new terms, Susie, law versus custom and tradition. We're not, yeah, so the word Nahagu means to practice or to have a custom. So I think that's appropriate. So what's the difference between Chayav and Machmir? Your Chayav if you eat pork, right? If you eat pork, you've done something wrong. But you're not chayiv if you drink, let's say, outside of a small community, if you drink normal milk. You're machmir if you only drink chal of Yisrael, right? You only drink Jew Jewish milk, right? You're not chayiv if you eat regular kosher meat. You're machmir if you only eat glot kosher meat. Right? Kosher meat is kosher meat. Glot kosher meat, all right, that's like another level. Now it's become standard practice, don't get me wrong. But no posek, no rabbi would say non-glot kosher meat that is kosher is not kosher. It's kosher. It's just not glot. So what, Purim Katan now has become a day of intensity. I don't mean like intensity, but rather it is a day of back to the aspirational model of Purim. Not about a day of when you need to do things, but the question now of what one can do. What one has the custom of doing, what one has the practice of doing. It is very much put in this more impersonal terms of um, lo nahagu lasot blah blah blah. Right, the world doesn't really have the custom of 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 of, sell, of freaking out, except on Yodal at Shalad Arisham. Vachshav lo nahagu laharbo besuda. Right, and nowadays says Yosef Karo, no one really has the practice of making, throwing a big party, not on the 14th, not on the 15th of the first month of Adar. So Purim Katan ends up being this undefined day in which what's being argued about is like, do we even do something for it? Okay, so here comes the Coles notes. Here he says, Yom Yudal V'tet Vav Sheva Adar so here's like the bottom line halacha for Yosef Karo, right? Which becomes really like the big, you know, this is the big uh, consensus in the Jewish world. 14th and 15th of Adar Rishon, you don't say Tachanun. That's the bottom line for him. You don't noflim al penehem, right? You don't fall on your face. But that's a, it's a circumlocution for saying Tachanun. You don't say the sad, you don't say the sad Yom Kippur style prayer. You don't say a prayer in which you focus on what you're sorry about. That's a whole group of days, right? A whole group of days like Rosh Chodesh and other days like that, right? It's we they're they're better they're better than average days because you don't focus on what you're sorry about. The Asurim behespeid v'taanit, and he disagrees with the Torah. He says, and you're not allowed to eulogize, and you're not allowed to fast. So Purim Katan is a day in which you are not allowed to do things that make you sad. Wait a second, what does that sound like?
text number which? Zoom, zoom, zoom. It's Rav Yosef. Purim Katan is Rav Yosef's Purim. I mean, except for the Malacha part. But you're not allowed to do things that make you sad. That's Purim Katan. According to the according to uh, the Shulchan Aruch. Aval. Okay, so you're not allowed to eulogize. You're not allowed to fast. You're not allowed to say a prayer that makes you sad. Okay. Aval Sh'ar Dvarim. Here comes Susie's point. But everything else. Ain't no hagim bahem. We don't have the practice of doing it. Okay, but that doesn't, again, it's not that you can or can't or should or shouldn't. It's just that people don't have to. We don't have the custom of doing it. So Purim is now, Purim Katan. Um, if someone dies, you have to bury them, but you just, you, you don't say a eulogy that is designed to induce. Part of the thing about eulogies is they have to think about emotional performance in its original context. Or the, um, sermons and eulogies and speeches like that, the point of them weren't just to like say something nice. The point of it was to evoke tears, right? to evoke crying and to induce a sense of sadness. So you say something much shorter, something much less emotional, and then, but then you can also obviously publicize or promulgate like a, a more emotional speech after the days, because it just doesn't fit in that kind of context. So Purim Katan, not a day in which you're allowed to engage in intentionally sad things, but you don't have to do things that make it a, make it a celebratory day either necessarily, but you're not, not allowed to. You can, if you want to, I guess. V'yesh Omrim, ah, but here again, Purim Katan never could be just simple. But some other people say, mutarim. Some people say, i.e. he means the tour, that you can even do things that make you sad. You can say a eulogy. You can fast. So Purim Katan remains a day that is like completely not agreed upon. What even is it? Who knows? Unclear. That's Yosef Karo. Yosef Karo, like, in the Shulchan Aruch, he's saying on one hand, it is either a day in which it is Rav Yosef's Purim, of the day in which you're not allowed to intentionally engage with things that would bring you down, but also you don't have to do things that bring you up. But then he quotes the tour, you know, say, but not everyone agrees. Some people even say that's a day in which you have complete access to the range of, of things, you know, of, of sensibilities and feelings that you can't even do things that are sad. Here comes the Ramah. So the Shulchan Aruch is a two-parted, majorly two-part text. One is Yosef Karo, and then there's, which is called the Shulchan Aruch, the set table. And then there's the gloss by 16th century Polish rabbi Moshe Israelis, which is called, very few people know this, Hamapa. What is a mapa in Hebrew? Tablecloth. A tablecloth. So Yosef Karo wrote this set table, and, Yosef, and Moshe Israelis, God, uh, there's so many puns in Jewish literature, I love it, wrote the table, wrote the tablecloth. It is a gloss on the Shulchan Aruch. Okay, he says, Vehaminhag. Thank you, Susie. Exactly. We are in the realm of practice. But the practice, Kisvara Harishona. No, the right way to do this, again, not what you need to do, but the best way to do this, the customary way to do this, is the first opinion. You don't do things that make you sad. Yesh Omrim Shechayev Laharbot B'mishteh. Not only that, but he brings back the riff. He says, not only that, but there are some people who say, you need to be happy on Purim Katan. You need to be happy. What? <laughs> we just brought back the entire range again. Yosef Karo quotes the position of the tour in which you're allowed to be sad, and now the Ramah has brought back the riff in which he says you need to be happy. No one can agree about Purim Katan. No one has an answer. <laughs> um, right, he says tour, but ain't no hugging, ain't no hugging cane. It's just like, ah, who knows? He says, ah, okay, okay. The right way to do this is like the first opinion. You don't, you aren't sad, but some people say you need to be happy, but nobody really agrees. That's that's what he just said. They know Hagin Kane, but we don't like we don't have the Minog. Oh my God, Mikomakom. Yeah, this is why I love this so much. Mikomakom, Yarvek Tzad Besuda. Still, he says, still you should make a little bit more of a feast. 
Eat a little bit more than you would otherwise. Pig out a little bit. In order to make the machmir people happy. This is like, you know, like, uh, yeah, kind of, Susie. It's not just a regular day. Okay, I want to take us through the whole journey. I want to take us through, this is an incredible journey. Uh, this is why learning halakha is amazing. It is not just yes or no. This is why I love Purim Katan. It is so woolly. It's so woolly. All right, so, so okay, take it in order. Yosef Karo says, uh, Purim Katan, you don't do things that are sad. You don't say tachanin, you don't say eulogy, and you don't fast. But everything else you don't need to do necessarily. It's just that you don't do things that make you feel worse. Okay. But some people say that you're actually allowed to do things that make you feel worse. You're allowed to eulogize. You're allowed to fast. You're allowed to do mourning kind of things. Okay. So not bad. Or maybe even, yeah, you can even feel sad. Then comes the Ramah, and the Ramah says, no, you're supposed to, you're not supposed to let, make yourself sad. Not just that, but some people even say you have to be happy. You have to do things that make you happy. But we don't, but no, but no one really accepts that either. But still, here comes like, you know, that's the real like from kind of like thumb rolly kind of part of it. But still, it's good to like have like a nice big-ish meal to make it a little bit better than it would be otherwise so that the Mahmur people are satisfied. It's just like the way, you know, it's like the, the like the frumification of halacha, right? Of like, okay, yeah, fine, this is what the base bottom line is, but still you should do it a little bit more, a little bit better in order to make the Mahmur people happy. But here it's like, listen, you don't have to be happy on Purim, says the Ramah, but you should be a little bit more happy just so the Mahmur position is, is satisfied. Make yourself, a, just do it a little bit. What room is that? What move is that? Mikol makom yarvek tzad visu, I need to read it this way. Mikol makom yarvek tzad visu de kadei latzai su de machmirim, right? Like, still, you should do a little bit. Just like have a little bit of a better dinner. So that the, so it works from the Machmer position. And here comes my favorite line in Halacha, and I actually want to make sure this is very clear to you. What's the last simon in the Shulchan Aruch or Achayim, the section of the Shulchan Aruch, which is about like practice, about daily, yearly, regular Jewish practice? What's the last simon of it? Does anyone know? Give me a number. Who knows what the last simon of or Achayim Shulchan Aruch? I'll give you a hint. It's on my source sheet. I'm not going to ask you some random thing. I gave you the answer. I always give you the answer. I'm like the cat who ate the canary. Come on, what's the, what's the, what's the last simon? Simon means... Um, 197. 697 is absolutely correct. It's 697 right here, baby. The last words of this work of halacha are these words. Betov lev mishta tamid. It's a happy heart that's always feasting. Where is that from? Well, it's from the book of Proverbs. Kol yamei onni ra'im. All the days of the poor are wretched, but the happy heart is always partying. Rashi says on that pasuk, "Kol yamei ani ra'im." All the days of the poor are wretched. Vafilu shabbatot v'yantiv. Now, you know, on one hand, this is a material point, right? That not having material resources, not having access to food, being food insecure, da da da, means that life is much more bottom line difficult. That is, even it even eb erodes and ebbs away from Shabbos and yantiv. But if we read it more, let's say emotionally or psychologically. That all the days of, let's say, if you're spiritually impoverished, are wretched. Even Shabbos and Yuntif. Right? Much like, I think, actually, what a number of comments have said in this class so far, that you miss something essential about the day itself, and the programming of the day doesn't work anymore. Even the happiest days of your, of your year, of your week, Shabbos, Yuntif, right? The days that you, lift, you look forward to, all six days of the week, all year long, you're, you're waiting for Yuntif. Even those works are, even those days are sapped of joy because you're not in it. 
You're not in it. But tov lev, mi shelibo, tov bit oshro, somebody whose heart is happy with what they have. So it's not about poor versus rich. It's about content versus discontent. It's about appreciative, ver it's about, you know, uh, what's the word, the words people, some psychologists use nowadays, it's about a, uh, uh, a, a, a mindset in which you are paying attention to what is missing versus a mindset in which you are paying attention to what you have. A happy heart, i.e. A, a heart, a mind, a consciousness that is content and appreciative of what it is you have. Mishta tamid, you are always feasting. Kol shnotav domotlo yemei mishta. All of your time, all of your year, all of your days appear to you as if they are days of feast. Lila meidicha, to teach you. That's the language we saw in the Gemara. Melamed, 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 says Rabbi Yosef. Sheyehe adam sameach bechelko. That a person must be happy with their portion. It is about contentment. It is not about what you have, but rather your disposition towards it. So what is Purim Katan really about? In a way, we got bogged down in these halachic details, these rules about what you should do, shouldn't do, have to do, need to do, want to do. But Purim Katan isn't about obligation. Purim Katan is about providing you an, an undefined day in which you're able to make it something of your own. The, I, I'm making that claim because he's quoting this Pasuk and Rashi's commentary on it is definitive. A happy heart is feasting always. That's the pedagogy of Purim Katan. That it's not about forcing you to do something, but it's about providing you the opportunity to bring your relationship to it. To bring yourself to the day. To find your happiness within it, rather than the structure of the day contouring it for you. Thoughts? We're all we're not done yet. We're but that's the but we're at the denouement now because that's the climax. It is an incredible thing in my opinion. I really mean to you know, say half of this is about Purim Katan the day today. Half of this is about actually what is I think unique about halacha as a as a literature and as a discourse. It is not I think an accident. It is not meaningless that the last words of the Ramah's gloss on Shulchan Aruch is, a, is this comment, that halacha is not about turning you into halachabat 5000, about beco becoming a yes-no person, of always being obsessed about fulfilling your obligations. Halacha is about internalizing about embodying a way of living in which you're able to take into yourself what it is Torah is trying to teach us so that you can act within it skillfully, wisely, and expressively even. It's about providing a framework for you to move within, not about a narrow path that you're always walking. It's about carving out space in your life so you can move freely and beautifully within it. Purim Katan ends up, I think, being a really fascinating glitch in halacha, but really, in a way, the glitch shows us what it's about. Halacha isn't just about yes, no, bad, good questions. Halacha is about life. And Purim Katan is about how we're able to make that life tune that life into what it should be, rather than just reduce life to what it has to be. 
to make life what it can be rather than just focus on what it ought to be. Um, here comes another uh, beautiful halachic text from a beautiful halachic work by um, Kichel Michel Epstein, who's a Russian um, halachic writer from the late 19th century. And he wrote a book called Aruch HaSholchan, obviously a play on Shulchan Aruch. Um, he, here's what he says on, on Purim Katan. He says, V'yesh Omrim, so he quotes the riff, right? The riff as we saw cited in the, in the Torah. There are some who say that you need to make a big feast on Purim Katan. But he agrees with the Ramad. We, we don't have that minag. We don't, we don't hold by the riff. You don't need to throw a party on Purim Katan. As it's implied in the Gemara. There's no chiyuv in Adar Rishon. Now you could see that as merely being a negative statement. But there's no halacha about Adar Rishon. No, it's no, Purim Katan is nothing. But I think it's nothing in the sense that it is nothing holding you down. Purim Katan is not about chiyuv. It's not about what you have to do. It's about what you can do. It's about what you can do if you're tuned in. It's about recapturing that spirit of Purim that's not about what you are forced to do, but rather about what's the right way to do it. You're allowed to go to your job in Purim, says, says Rambam. It's just that maybe you shouldn't, because if you, if, as Maxine said earlier, if you, if you get the core concept of the idea, why would you go to your job? If you get the core concept of Purim, even Purim Katan, or I would say maybe even even being a Jew, then you'd want to tap into what it means to have simcha on this day. Why wouldn't you? You'd only not want to be joyous on Purim Katan if you've reduced Torah to obligation. But Purim Katan reminds us that Torah is not just about obligation. Ein chiyuv adarishon. Torah is not just about what you are forced to do. Torah is about what is best to do. Torah is about what you can do to magnify God's name in this world, to bring a spirit of simcha and yantif into existence. The Chatzav Rabbeinu HaRama, Rama writes, to mikol makom, mikol makom, still, even though there's no chiyuv, still, yarbek tzas besudo, you still eat a little bit more, you still have a little bit of a nice meal, buy yourself that, that dessert, treat yourself to a beer. Give yourself a little bit extra happiness today. That's, that's Purim Katan. You don't have to, but learn how to be kind to yourself, to the world. In order to satisfy the, you know, the Machmirs. V'tov lev mishtatami. It's a happy heart that's celebrating always. We went to this, that point earlier. End quote. Klomar, he paraphrases him. Iker avodat Hashem hu b'simcha. The essence of serving God is in joy. The ikr of serving God is simcha. Vilachin, therefore, kishe kavanato l'shem mitzvah, hi mishteh v'simcha shal mitzvah. When your heart and your consciousness is tuned in to fulfilling mitzvah, that is the joy of mitzvah. That is a, a, a holy feast. He gestures towards a messianic point even, a redemptive point, that God will bring us happiness in building the Beit HaMikdash and in bringing the Redeemer, uh, uh, the, the Redeemer of justice. What is this Purim Dick consciousness? It's realizing that the essence of serving God isn't about Halacha Bat 5000. It's about tapping and tuning into the joy of what it means to be a Jew. There's a lot that's powerful about Torah's focus on what our responsibilities are. Because it's not Judaism, it's not Torah to say that life is just about doing what you wish or doing what you want. 
But to reduce Torah to being just about what you are forced to do misses the core of what it means to be not just practicing as a Jew, but celebrating as a Jew. Purim Katan is about enjoying being Jewish. It's about realizing that there's an invitation to celebrate that in a way is more powerful than the obligation. It opens a door that you can choose to step through because it gives you an opportunity to not just have to serve through joy, but to enjoy serving. It brings us back in touch with our enjoyment of what it is to be in Torah. Everyone's had a hard Shabbos. Everyone's had a hard Yantif. Sometimes the rules are a lot. Purim Katan reminds us that the rules provide a structure in which we can act. And it reminds us also that our joy is invited and needed just as much as our will. Our heart is wanted as much as our hands. And that our joy is the essence of what it means to be in this conversation. Um, the last text is from a um, couple texts from Sadaka Cohen of Lublin. And we'll look at these in English because the, the Hebrew is a little tough. Sadaka Cohen of Lublin, late 19th, early 20th century, uh, Polish, obviously he's from Lublin, Hasidic master in the line of the Swat Emet, in the line of the, uh, the central Polish Hasidic rabbis who focus especially on questions of interiority, spiritual, spirituality. You see, he writes this. In the first chapter of the Talmud tractate on Purim, Megillah, it says, there's no difference, or we saw this text already, there's no difference between first and second Adar, except for the reading Megillah, sending money to the poor, and um, not eulogizing, not fasting, etc. It said nothing regarding feasting and rejoicing, right? This is the, this is the dilemma we've been talking about now for the whole class. It says, Bapurim Katan, it just says what you're not supposed to do. It doesn't say anything about what you have to do. It doesn't say anything about throwing a feast. It doesn't say anything about what it means to rejoice. Thus, the decisors, the post scheme, have disagreed over it, right? That's what the whole class has been about. No one can agree about what Purim Katan is. However, in truth, of all the MS, the essence of revelation is by means of reading the Megillah because they have the same Hebrew root. What is revelation in Hebrew? Gilui. And what is Megillah in Hebrew? Megillah. Gilui, gamid, uh, Gimel, Lamed, right? Weak, and Megillah, right? They have the same root. Now, it's not, um, see you, thanks for joining. It's not quite the same Hebrew root, because actually Galal and Galah, but whatever, the point is, is that it's close enough. Um, so Megillah and Gilui, Revelation and Megillah are the same. Um, <laughs> that's my note from 10 years ago. They don't, but they share similar letters, fine. Uh, thus, when there is no reading of the Megillah, there is no rejoicing. Um, Gila, Rina, Ditsa, Vechedba, right? So re Revelation, rejoicing, and Megillah all have similar letters from their roots, Gimel and Lamed. So no Megillah, no rejoicing. So if we don't have to read the Megillah, there's no obligation to rejoice in Purim Katan. Similarly, when there is no giving to the poor, there's no feasting, because those two things are, are united according to the Zohar. An incredible point, right? You're not allowed to have a, a, a feast meal if you're not also making sure that the poor get their share. Something I think we in the contemporary community need to remember. When there is no giving to the poor, there's no feast. So in the Ramaz text on the Shulchan Aruch, he says, Tov leves mishtatamid, a happy heart is always rejoicing. And the Spirit of God speaks in the Ramah. He says, ah, he's getting something essential here. Because when he says in the, in the Ramah's introduction to the Shulchan Aruch, he says, um, Shivisi Hashem Nagdi tamid. He's quoting, it's a whole commentary on like that the essence of davening, that to prepare yourself for davening, is to set God before you always. That is the beginning of the holiness of what it means to be a Jew in our panemius, in our interiority, in our, inside of our consciousness. The month of Nisan is the, be is the beginning of the months, or it's the beginning of the, of, the, of the biblical year. 
um, both in time and also in our souls. And after one completes one's soul, when you like bring completion to it, fulfillment, by means of one's bodily activities in doing the mitzvot, one reaches the completion of the year in Adar. Ah, so if Nisan's the beginning of the Torah's year, what's the end of the Torah's year? It's Adar. So Adar is when we bring completion to ourselves. It's the climate, it's the culmination of a process that began with Passover of our freedom, free to develop ourselves, to grow, and to be our full, our full souls. And in Adar, we bring a completion to that process, a fulfillment to it. How do we know that? Because Adar focuses on joy. You reach the completion of the year in Adar with a happy heart. That's why a happy heart is always feasting. Adar is a month of joy because Nissan's a month of freedom. Freedom is what allows us to have joy. Right? We are not the ones who are rejoicing if we are not free. Since one's heart has been perfected in one's efforts, the whole year, according to the Rev Tzadok, is about learning how to be happy. That's the work of the year, to learn about yourself. You are freed from your enslavements, and you are to learn what it is that brings authentic joy. But remember, qualified with the fact that real joy means giving. Real joy means attuning and attending to others. It's not about selfishness. It's not about ego. It's about fulfillment. It's about bringing a sense of growth, a sense of actualization. But when the year is a leap year, we don't add an extra month that we never heard of. We double a dar. He says, often the first is praised, but here the second is praised, right? Since it's connected to Nisan. Usually the first of something in a series is the, is the nicer one, but here the second one is because it's the last part of the year. So then what's the first adar doing? If we're saying adar is special because it is the end of a process, but you double that month in a leap year, which means now that we're in the penultimate month of the year, that's less of a big deal. So what do you do with that? It says first is the image of the second, because but it comes first, kind of like how the shell or the rind of the fruit comes before the fruit. Now, that's a very big Kabbalistic idea, which we're not going to get into too much. But the point of that is, like I was saying before, actually, it's about carving out a space in which something can happen. The orange rind makes sure that fruit can exist. Fruit can't exist without the rind shielding it from the elements, providing it protection. Even though it's outside, it is actually what's needed first. So Adari Shon ends up being the setting the staging ground for what it means to access joy. My claim is that Purim Katan wouldn't work if it were a day in which we were obligated to do all of these celebratory things because we're not ready yet. Purim Katan is special because it is a day in which we're not required to do anything, which gives us the freedom and the space that we need to access that essence of joy. Because it is an invitation to uh, touch that core principle, to remember and to realize uh, the joy of what it means to be in this Jewish story. Um, uh, finish with this text from the Pretzedek, which is by the same rabbi. He says he's quoting the text that we saw before about Tov Lev Mishatami, the happy heart is always feasting. And he says, as with many sign offs, right, like final words. There does not seem to be any direct connection, except saying something nice. So, you know, like a lot of Haftorahs, make sure, make sure to end in like a nice sentiment. He says, okay, maybe it's just like a nice thing to say at the end of the book. He says, no, but you're missing something. But one could say, he says, that its meaning is not understood. It has a secret hidden meaning. And it should really read, the happy heart feasts always. It should read instead, um, Tov Lev Mishatamid. Because, as Rashi says, someone who is happy with what you have, i.e. happiness as a practice, 
not just as a feeling. Right? Learning how to recognize and appreciate the blessing of what it is that you've been gifted. That is what it means to have a happy heart. A, ha a heart as happy as a feast every day. That's what that means. It's not that you're like always pigging out if you are happy, but rather if your heart is, um, your, you, 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 what is your heart doing? Your heart is feasting every day. It's your heart that is feasting. It's your faculty of gratitude that is gorging itself because this whole world is full of things to be, to celebrate. It says you're happy with your portion, says Rashi. That's what it means. You have a whole world, a whole world of beauty, a whole world of gift. And the question really is, are you able to see it even though you don't have to? That's Purim Katan. The invitation to recognize what is there and what is worth celebrating without being forced. It is an autonomization. It is a freedom. It is freeing yourself to have the privilege to be grateful. The whole world is gorged with joy. And the question we're left with is, will we accept the invitation to indulge? Purim Katan is a day of kindness, I think, because it gives us, it opens the door and it invites us to have a better day than we would otherwise. It allows us to be happy. But I think it also teaches us that happiness is in always tucked within the crevices of what life entails. Someone who accesses this truly feels Someone who accesses this feels in truth or feels the truth senses the truth when they say the Shema that God is one. And what does that really mean? That God is ever-present, omnipresent in the goodness and in that which makes good. Both in the goodness and the happiness and the joy we're able to access and in the joy that we're, that is able to be created, the joy that is created for us and the joy that is created by us. Tov and Metiv, by the good and the making of good. Um, so what started as kind of like an abstruse, even maybe obscure halachic question of how can a legal text talk about a day that it has no consensus about, that they can't agree about, and also that has no clear guidelines? which is a decent question to ask, I think actually ends up really cracking open what is unique about halakha as a law, discourse of law. That we are wrong to see halakha just as this binary question of yes, no, allowed, per, uh, forbidden, um, obligated, permitted. But rather, Purim Katan is about reminding us that halacha is trying to train us to access the good. What is good in life and what is good in the world. It is perhaps a paltry and even maybe meager point to say that one who is content is able to be happy. But rather that Purim Katan is reminding us of a connection that we're missing that Torah is not to, about reduction to what you have to do, but Torah is about teaching us how to access what is right to do and what is best to do. And it provides a certain amount of space for our own expression of self, because that question of what is best is not externally defined. It's accessible and definable by ourselves. There's nothing you have to do on Purim Katan. The consensus that we're left with is what is nice to do. But that in a way reminds us that Torah in a way is what is nice to do.
Torah is not about something we have to do. Torah is about something that is good to do and something that, God willing, we're able to even enjoy doing. This is a strong strike against the notion that what is good or what is right is what is obligated always. You know, whether you're, it's a philosophical system that is suspicious of pleasure when you do something good, or it's a more like robotic version of what halacha entails. Purim Katan is reminding us that Torah is not just about what you are forced or coerced into doing or what have you, but rather it is about re-accessing that Torah is something we do even when we don't have to. But Torah opens up a space in which we're able to bring ourselves because we're able to touch something sweet we do if just because we want to. So I hope in a way that we are able to access that invitation, the open door, door of Purim Katan, of remembering that there's nothing ever in a way that forces us to feel about the world, that we always have an opportunity to find in it what is, what is possible, that the world is an incredibly beautiful thing that no one can ever force you to love but rather to force love is to misunderstand what the very nature of that thing is. That there's so much beautiful, there's so much gorgeous, and there's so much good to be found. And Purim Katan is a day that reminds us that it's something that can't be forced, but only something that can be invited in. And I hope for us all to be able to find a little bit of that invitation for ourselves. Chaim, Shkayach.